other. That's okay, too. Amen. Amen. I have been waiting to meet with you, eager to share this time with you, because I believe God has a message for us this morning, a message that we, we need at this point in our lives, and it's fresh, just like fresh bread has its so good of an aroma, and I believe the Word of God is going to bless us this morning. Amen? Are you excited? Amen. Please meet me in your Bibles in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4 to 14 is our, uh, is our uh, text for this morning. Habakkuk chapter 2. Now, Habakkuk is, again, a minor prophet, and his name means what? His name means, well, yes, his name means to embrace and to wrestle, and I've nicknamed him Hugs and Squeeze, which you can remember well. And we're in that uh, series of hugs and squeeze. Who doesn't like to get a hug? Anyone? Oh, Alex, did, did I see a hand over there? No, okay. <laughs> no, don't hug Alex. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, it's warm. It's good to be embraced. It's good to be known. It's good to be loved. And I believe our loving Savior is doing that to us today through his word. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4 to 14 is our text this morning. And if you are able, please, I invite you to stand with me as I read God's word. See, he is puffed up, his desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest because he is as greedy as the grave And like death is never satisfied, he gathers himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your debtors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up, not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their victim because you have plundered many nations. The peoples who are left will plunder you, for you have shed man's blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain, to set his nest on high, to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And let me read for you verse 20 as well in the same chapter. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. You may take a seat. Father God, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we yield to your Holy Spirit to illuminate our hearts as we receive this, your word, your truth. May your word And may your spirit unite for it to become the rhema, the living word of God among us, to transform us, to teach us, and to guide us, so that we may become more like Jesus, our loving Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Keith Braden, a granddad, 61 years of age, He's a war veteran. He works at the local grocery store. His hair has recently grown back, and he's recently gained back the weight that he had because he had some chemotherapy. Last Sunday, he went to church with his wife, with his two sons and a grandchild, and his life was taken as he was singing hymns to our Lord at a small Baptist church in Texas. 
26 people lost their lives in a very similar setting like this. So we cannot help but ask the question, why? Keith Braden, who's a war survivor, a cancer survivor, who had so much life in front of him, yet evil struck. His wife, Debbie, is critically wounded. His granddaughter, six years of age, is also critically wounded. His two sons were killed. In these times of agony, in these times of despair, sadness, losing our loved ones, we need to be reminded of the verse that we just read in your hearing from Habakkuk 2, verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. And that's the title of my message this morning, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Will you say that to a neighbor to your left and to your right? But the Lord is in his holy temple. But the Lord is in his holy temple. When we face times of such great trials, tribulations, and when we hear news not only of Texas, but around the world of people being devastated by terrorism, by earthquakes, by tsunamis, we have to go to this verse because that's the only verse that will help us to get through these times of asking why just as the prophet Habakkuk, hugs and squeeze, asked about his time. We learnt in chapter 1 that hugs and squeeze, he's a Judean, and his people are wicked. So he says, God, what's going on? Why, Lord? How long, Lord? And the Lord answers this, more violence. More wickedness will come to you and judge you, and those are the Babylonian people or else known as the Chaldeans. In chapter 2, again, Habakkuk asks these questions, but in faith, and God is giving an answer to him. And last week we learned that I will live faithfully by what? By listening, by writing, and by what? Waiting. Those who wait upon the Lord shall receive strength. Are we waiting for him? We are a waiting church. You know why? Because we are a praying church. We are waiting for God's perfect timing. And today, we find ourselves, God, responding to Habakkuk once again. But now, there's going to be five woes. Everyone say, five woes. Does that sound happy to you or sound a bit gloomy to you? Okay, sounds a bit gloomy. Indeed it is. The woe in Hebrew, this is a term used to prepare a way for a declaration of judgment. Judgment is coming for the Babylonians, for the Judeans, and also for the unrighteous. Look with me in verse 4 of this chapter. Verse 4 starts off like this. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright. Well, puffed up, what does that mean? Well, it means that a person is arrogant and proud. You, you know those people that, that are very proud? Can you, can you think of anyone? Maybe at your workplace? I, maybe your boss? I don't know. But somebody who's really proud that will never say sorry. When, when they've done wrong, and you know that they've done and you have proof that they've done wrong, but they will never say sorry. They are proud and arrogant kind of people. Well, that's the Babylonians, that's the Judeans, and that's the character of unrighteous people. Prideful people. Not only that, these people, they have desires that are not pure, that are not upright. It's like, again, kind of like this. They, they go to your house. They take your brand new 65-inch 4K TV that you just bought yesterday from Best Buy. They just take it. They say, this is mine. I'm taking it. 
And you say, what? That's my TV. I say, nope, that's mine. Their desires are evil. And you call the police, and the police say, that's all right. There's no law here. That's okay. Let them do whatever they want. How would you feel? A state of, what is going on? Evil is lurking around. Continue to look with me in verse 4. I love it when God puts a but in the word of God. Now, don't go, don't go there, okay? If This is the but with one T. But the righteous will live by his faith. So the dichotomy is this. The unrighteous do not have faith in God. They live as if that they are their own God. But the righteous live by faith in God. They trust God. They follow God. They listen to God. They obey God. And they receive from God the blessings that nothing else can give. Amen? I don't know about you. Maybe some of us are thinking, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of a righteous person. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't hurt people. I don't, you know, physically harm people. I don't, you know, I don't do much bad things, so I must be a righteous person. Well, that may be true to an extent, but let me share with you today what real righteousness is. Righteousness is putting your faith in God, being justified by your faith in God. Again, putting your faith in God. Last week, I told you about the friend who, who came to me and said, I, if you show me God, I will believe him. Uh, a brother, my brother Larry, we were in our uh, teaching team meeting this week, and he said, well, next time you meet that friend, tell him this. Look around you. Look around you. Because do you know what I see? I see Jesus in each one of you. I see God's image in each one of you. So the fellowship and seeing God, because when God transforms you, you have a different lens of looking, a different worldview. Before, I would have a negative worldview. Now God has transformed me to see the good. Have you ever noticed that maybe some of your children or your friends, they will remember one thing that you did wrong out of the 99 things that you did right? It's like, can't, can't you remember the 99 things I did for you? And you're like hanging on to this one thing? Again, the righteous will live by faith. God begins to transform us. And that's the process of sanctification. We are a holiness people, by the way. We have to remember that. We are a holiness people. Holiness unto the Lord is our Watch, word, and song. Holiness unto the Lord as we're marching along. And I have to finish this. Sing it, shout it all day long. Holiness unto the Lord now and forever. We are a holiness people. And we live by faith and not by sight. Maybe your life, maybe the circumstances seem so bleak right now. But God is in the midst he is there. He is there. And he is speaking to us this morning. Let's continue. Verse 5. We have a lot of ground to, to cover. Verse 5 is talking about the character of the unrighteous. Let me read for you. Indeed, wine betrays him. In, in these days, if you drink wine, that means you have won a battle. You are the victor. So you are drinking wine again. Wine will betray anyone. Not any man is strong enough to withstand against wine. Do you know how I know that? I come from a line of alcoholics, but by God's grace, we are free today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Imagine me. If God didn't save me, I would have been in that bottle. I would have made decisions that would have harmed me, harmed my relationships, if I continue to make those decisions, I would have never been able to meet one of you, each one of you, and be with you today, and I'm so glad. And I've been saying this all week, I am all in. I am all in. God's calling is sure. His promises are true, and God is doing a new thing. 
Wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. Verse 5. Because he is as greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. What does this mean? Well, it means that wealth, people who go after wealth and money and fame, that's, that's going to betray you. It will. Do you know that the love of money will never satisfy you? I mean, let's say you have a goal of getting a million dollars in your savings account. All right, you work hard. You don't go to Starbucks, you brew your coffee at home, you don't eat out, you eat home, you, you don't you know, get the brand new car, you get the old car and you save and save and you reach that million dollar mark. You've reached it. Yes, I'm there. I, I, I've made it. What's next? Well, you want another million dollars, don't you? You're never satisfied. The testimonies of people who've won the lottery, I mean, they've struck gold, won millions of dollars. I don't know if one of them are really happy. I don't know. For me, if I can't manage $100 well, it will be a curse to me if God gave me a million dollars. Correct? So begin to manage your $1 well. Ties to God. Give to Him. Don't steal from him. Because money doesn't command you. You command money by God's grace. You tell it where to go. God has been teaching me that money can be such an attractive thing, you know. It, it kind of gets you close, and it's really difficult to detach. But God's law, when he says, don't love money, it's true. Just obey it. Don't love it. Command it. Ask the Lord where you should spend your money. Amen? Suddenly the, the congregation goes silent. Let all the earth be silent before him. Amen? Okay. From verse 6, we begin to see five woes. And I talked to you about them. If you have your Bibles and if you have a pen, I'd like you to circle these five woes. Okay? And if you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. Circle the one to your next door neighbor, okay? A, a verse, verse 6 has a woe in it, so circle that. That is woe 1. Verse 9 is woe 2. Circle that. Verse 12 is woe 3. Verse 15, woe 5. And verse 19, woe 5. Sorry, woe 4 and woe 5. So 6, 9, 12, 15, and 19 have five woes. And this is talking about God's judgment. Finally, finally, the bad people are getting the judgment that they deserve. This is good. I always love, uh, used to watch you know, movies that have these plots of the good guys win and the bad guys, they have to lose. I mean, nowadays they twist it. You know, it's like the bad guy kind of resurrects. It's like, really? I love it when the good guy wins. And the bad guy loses. And this five, these five woes are talking about God's judgment on the evil people. Today we're going to tackle three of them. Woe one, woe two, woe three. All right, verse six. Verse six to verse eight is talking about the first woe. Let me read for you. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your debtors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their victim. You will be the one who will be stolen from you when you have that 65-inch 4K TV. You're the one who's going to get that stolen from you because you have plundered many nations. The peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed man's blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Finally, you are feeling this relief. Wow, yes, God, you are judging the unrighteous. You are judging the evil guys. This is good. This is talking about the greed and violence of the unrighteous people. Greed, more. I want more. I want more food. You go to a, a buffet, uh, all-you-can-eat buffet, and you just eat more. And then you know you're full, but... Because you pay 10 bucks, you eat more. 
And you eat more, and then you come out feeling like, I'm never going there again, but I got my $10 worth. And then you have indigestion, and it costs you more to buy that medicine to get that food down. But nonetheless, greed is like that. It's like you think you can handle it. More of this, more of that. I heard a story about a man who was given the opportunity to get as much land as he could. Uh, The only deal was you have to come back to your original place by the end of the day. So this man, who was quite greedy, went very far. He went so far, and he looked back, and he thought, okay, I can make it back. I can make it back. And he said, well, if I run back, I'll be able to make it. So he went further and further and further. Do you know what happened? He didn't make it back before the day was over. So what? Zero. Zilch. Jesus says, what good is it if you gain all the world and forfeit your soul? My goodness, we live in this age that constantly gives you information about you need this. Oh, you need this. You need this brand new shiny toy. Oh, if you don't have this, you're going to lose out. People are going to look down on you. You need this. All the messages from media is trying to get you to go a bit more further, a bit more further, so that you wouldn't get back a bit more further. Do you see it? You must see it, because this is deceit. These are the lies from the pit of hell. Listen, there is life at the source. There is life under the cross of Jesus Christ. There is life in Jesus. Would you not rather have eternal life than all the shiny toys? Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Let's go to verse 9. Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain, to set his nest on high, to escape the clutches of ruin. The second woe, if you're taking notes, is talking about false security. You are putting your trust in something that will crumble. Back in the day, kings and rich people would would put their mansions uh, near high places, and they would build walls around it and trenches around it, and they would think, I am safe here. Until many a times, the traitor was already inside. Do you have a traitor inside talking to you every day, saying, you need this? Remember that, that person that you were before? That's the real you. Nagging at you. Again, these voices that keep dragging you down. Remember this. God's voice will never pull you down. God's voice will always uplift you. God's voice will convict you of your sin to repentance. But the devil will always pull you down to his level, the pit of hell. So don't listen to the lies, but listen to the word of God, brothers and sisters. And that's why I encourage you to open this book and read it. And let the Lord speak to you through it. False security. Now in verse 11, let me read for you. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. See, because of this false security and because of this intentional evil, these walls, these stones, these stones are beginning to cry out, injustice, injustice, injustice. I found a a quote that Jesus used from this verse, and it's in Luke, Luke chapter 19. If you want to turn with me there, Luke chapter 19. And in your Bibles that we've given you, it's, it's on page 1040. Luke 19, verse 37 to 40. Uh, Jesus actually quotes this verse. So this is interesting. Luke chapter 19, 37 to 40. If you have found it, please say hugs and squeeze. Nope, John hasn't said it yet, so I'm going to wait for John. It's all right, John. Uh, 1040, yep. Luke 19, 37 to 40. Here we go. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
Some of the Pharisees and the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. This is it, verse 40. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. If the disciples don't praise Jesus, God, he's saying that the rocks will begin to cry out. Wouldn't that be interesting? Have you ever thought of that verse? What would it look like for the rocks to cry out? Jesus, I don't want to give that opportunity to the rocks. So I encourage us to praise him in the morning. Praise him, praise him, praise him in the morning, praise him in the evening, praise him. Praise him, praise him when the sun goes down. Jesus uses Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 11 for this. Redemption for the unrighteous. Habakkuk uses this, the same idea, the same verse, for judgment on the unrighteous. But Jesus, who is the redeemer of all things, by the way, speaks about redemption for the unrighteous. So if, by any chance, you are feeling some of this woe this morning, woe is me, woe, oh, I feel I'm like an unrighteous person, there is hope for you today. And we'll get to that in a moment. Woe number three. Let's keep moving on. Verse 12, verse 12. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire? That the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? Woe three is making light of human life. People killing people without even thinking about it. Just like what happened last week around this time in Texas at a small Baptist church where 26 people were killed in cold blood by a person. We don't know why. But killing is not from the Lord. God is a God who saves. God is a God who redeems, who delivers, and who heals. So again, God's judgment on these people, the unrighteous. And then we come to one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This word knowledge in this verse is yada in Hebrew. It means to know, to be aware, but to know intimately, to know deeply, as if a husband knows a wife on the first night of consummation after their marriage. Knowing deeply, knowing you, Jesus, knowing you. There is no greater thing. We just sang about that. There is meaning in that. But the thing is, the whole earth is going to know about God, his glory. Again, glory means this. It means heaviness. It means weight. So it comes down on us like a blanket. Some children like to have a, a blanket that's, that's kind of weighty. It gives them what? Security, comfort, helps them sleep. That's the glory, kabod, of God the glory of God, and that's what we yearn for in this community. That's what I'm praying for, for the churches around us, in this nation, for the glory of God to come down. But many a times, we don't want the glory of God. We want to do our programs. We want to do our own thing. Let me propose to you that our church will not do that. Let me propose to you that we will wait upon the Lord and when he gives us a sign to go, we will go. Until that time, we will stay and pray. It's okay. It doesn't matter if other churches have loads of programs. 
and loads of this and that. God bless them. But when God says, go for us, we will go. But until that time, we will wait upon the Lord. And when that time comes, watch out world. The gospel will be preached. Lost souls will come to Jesus. And we will see revival in our day. Amen? Glory. Glory. Amen. So I've been studying verse 14, and I, I'm going to end real quick. For the earth will be filled. And I thought of this. How about if I put my name into this verse and remind myself? So uh, instead of for the earth, instead of the earth, how about we put your names in there? Like Sarah, Lee, Bob, Kathy, Linda, Tom. For Elisha will be filled like this. Can we do that together? Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? Verse 14, for Elisha will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What would that look like? Many a times, water is linked to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters in Genesis. When the Holy Spirit covers you, you'll be able to forgive those who you have been harmed by. You'll be able to let go of the bitterness. You'll be able to let go of the pain from the past. You'll be able to entrust your children to them. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit covers us. But the Holy Spirit cannot work where there is sin. And that's why repentance is key in revival. Repentance, confession. So here we have come to the three woes and to God's glory. But the Lord is in his holy temple. He is not faced by the Texas shooting last week. Yes, he is broken for it. He did not author it. But he is still in his holy temple. Maybe you've lost a loved one, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Maybe you've lost a job, a place to live, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Maybe your children are going through times of difficulty, but the Lord is in his holy temple. And this is the message God has given me throughout this week. Remember this, my sons, my daughters, I am in the holy temple. I am for you. I know you, and I hear your prayers, and I hear your cries, and I see your tears, and I see your broken heart. But remember this, I am in the holy temple. I am your God. Will you let me be your God today? Will you let me help you through this pain, through this anger, through the frustration of life? Will you let me? And this is my encouragement to all of us this morning. Whatever you're facing, remember this verse, but the Lord, is in his holy temple. In the New Testament of 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it talks about the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Let me read it for you for the sake of time. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Again, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? Remember, but God is in his holy temple. You, God resides in you. 
When you accepted him through faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit resides in you, indwells in you. Verse 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred. And you are that temple. Hallelujah. This is the word of the Lord this morning. God lives in us. And maybe some of you are feeling far away from the Lord. Today is your day. Maybe some of you, you have never even thought about trusting in God because I am my own God. I will do things my way. Let me encourage you. I used to be that person. I used to be very proud. Proud in my accomplishments, proud in my intelligence, proud in the ways that the skill sets that I had. But God began to work in me, and he's still working in me, and I've come to realize this. I was once in darkness, but my, now my eyes can see. I was lost, but Jesus sought and found me. Oh, what love he offers. Oh, what peace he gives. I will sing forevermore he lives. I was once in darkness, now my eyes can see. I was lost, but Jesus sought and found me. Oh, what love he offers, oh, what peace he gives. I will sing forevermore, he lives. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Father. I am shielded by his word. I will live forever and I will never die. I will rise up to meet him in the sky. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, our Savior, Lord, and friend, thank you that, Jesus, you are able to turn around a woe of judgment for the unrighteous to the redemption of of the unrighteous by the giving of your life on the cross for our sins by the blood that you shed for us every drop of life was given so that we may have life so that we may be forgiven so that we may live a life that was not earned but given by grace through faith in you God and I pray, Lord, that we will remember every day of our lives as news hits us, devastation hits us, sadness hits us. We will quote the word of God. But the Lord is in his holy temple. And we are the temple of the living God. Help us to live in sight and in light of this truth, O oh God. Help us to apply this word well, to live it out. Help us, Lord, to follow you all the days of our lives. And help us to hold on to things lightly, for this world is fleeting. But your eternal kingdom is near and has come. So we honor you at this time. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.